Y'all already know what time it is. It's time for another obligatory vlog review of some other random JRPG game I've played. This time, as I've said before, we're done with Final Fantasy. I'm actually holding on to that series for an indefinite time. Until maybe an HD version of 12 is released, so fuck all that bullshit. Anyways. There was a sale three months ago. An equinox of... What's not even an equinox? It was the 21st. The 21st of March. And they had three games on sale for the PSN Flash. One of them was... Wild Arms and Wild Arms 2. The rest were just a bunch of Capcom games. And as such... I got myself Breath of Fire 4, along with those other three games, for a steal. I didn't really care about that demo for the Silent Hill game. It wasn't really my cup of tea since I never really got into survival horror. But yeah, this was a game that I've played as a kid, well at least I've seen other people play it since I was five. Since everyone was waiting for Final Fantasy X. But Breath of Fire 4 was kind of cool for me for a couple of reasons. Up until then the only JRPGs I saw were Beyond the Beyond, Final Fantasies 7, 8, and 9, and Chrono Cross. And here came a game that did things a little differently. Some of the things that caught my attention were dragon transformations, 2D sprites in a 3D world, the fact that the world map was kind of more of a an actual map, where you go one destination and it kind of moves across a grid, not a grid, but like a, he moves to, through a way, so you press down, he goes to the area south. That the south destination or left or right. Let me explain. It's like Final Fantasy Tactics world map system. That's one thing that got me really interested in this when I was five. And I've seen plenty of playthroughs because my dad fucked up on the ending multiple times and ended up getting the bad ending twice. Which wouldn't have mean, meant much since I don't think he was capable of beating the final boss anyways. However, on to the actual review. First thing I'm going to talk about... Let me close the window. It's not that I don't like that kind of music. Because I do. But... It's copyrighted and... There was a time I got... My video flagged just because some idiot was playing music in the background, loudly. But it's Sunday and everyone's having their day off so they're all turning up. Even though that guy over there never seems to have other people turning up with him. Everyone in this hood seems to be turning up alone. At everybody else. So in the visual department. I really like 2D sprites in a 3D world type designs. I liked it with Xenogears. I really liked it with Persona 2. Well, I'm not sure if the backgrounds were 3D. I don't know, I just like the sprites from an isometric perspective. Or in a 3D background. I like things like that. To be perfectly honest, I see no reason as to why the PlayStation 1 was trying so diligently to do 3D for some of its games. It wasn't ready. They looked ugly as shit. They looked blocky beyond all imagination. While I've never complained about the visual departments of any of the 3D games, many of them were actually great for a time and still hold up if you have an open mind to it. The 2D sprites, they're still king. 
I like the 2D art style here. Sprites have a really nice old school Japanese art style. They don't look anime like the way Xenogears did or even SMT. They kind of looked like something you would see in I don't know, feudal art style stuff hundreds of years in the past except with a lot of color added it's not as monochromatic which is all the more amazing you love the blues greens just the color splashes are amazing and that I like more than the sprites itself and music wise this soundtrack gets a lot of criticism. It's really polarizing. Some people say that its soundtrack is on the same level of Secret of Mana in terms of greatness and it's the best thing they've heard. Others say the soundtrack is tremendously weak sauce and in the background, which I don't get and get at the same time. I know it's pseudo-intellectual to throw in contradictions willy-nilly, however for the first two chapters, the soundtrack was on point. All the town themes sounded amazing. All the boss themes kicked loads of ass. But by chapters three and four, it got a little repetitive. It lost its thematic and cinematic touch a little bit. And a lot of things really died in chapter 3. It's a surprise. The final boss themes for part 1 and 2 of this game suck. And by suck I mean they failed to be effective in giving you a final boss vibe. And that's a really bad criticism because your final boss theme should at the very least be to at least that should be 10 out of 10 no IGN. If that doesn't stack up then yeah your soundtrack really fucked up. But in general aside from the fact that it lost some of its luster it was still a very illustrious soundtrack for the first two acts of the game the first two chapters. It really gave it really told a story it told half of the story in itself along with the camera work, the way it's been directed, the actual dialogue and the sprite animations. I sprayed that, sorry guys. It was really good. Gameplay wise, I'm just talking about the good things so far. This game has a lot of good dungeons. The dungeons here have very little treasure, they're short. They don't have you going around all over the place the way I was doing in Dragon Quest V. Like, Dragon Quest V, there were so many dungeons and they had like 15 treasures in them. So I was always checking around and going crazy. And going through burnout because of it. However, here, usually there's two or three treasures around and they're really nice to get, really fun to get because no lighter have they'll have something useful. They'll have something that you can use. Like a really nice weapon or a really handy item. The same can't be said for Dragon Quest. Some of the things while I was playing that game it was like there were fifteen things and some of them weren't befitting of my playstyle anyway, so I didn't really need them. So I like the brevity of the dungeons, the effectiveness of the dungeons, everything felt different. All the puzzles, because your characters had innate abilities they can use specific to them to solve the puzzles in the dungeons, I thought that was cool. It's kind of like Golden Sun but taken down a few notches. It's not that crazy yet. 
and the battle system was pretty nice. Again, you can transform into a dragon in this game with Ryu. But there's a magic system and a skill system. Now, much like Final Fantasy IV, as you level up in this game, you gain more magic abilities and spells with every specific level up. So your characters fighting the game will have all the necessary skills to thrash anybody. But then there's the skill system. You gain skills every time you guard or essentially tank against monsters, which you can spend items to like switch them around and customize them on a different character if you want. But yeah, you can you can gain a couple of useful skills. In the beginning, it's really fun, the skill system, especially if you get them not necessarily from enemies, but from a master, a teacher who can give you a skill or bestow it upon you if you do what he tells you, kind of like a warrior guild system, except not as strict, and that was cool. You can gain a couple of useful skills, however, again, by the third and fourth act, unless you want to go crazy with the post game, which I know a lot of PC players do, you're not going to get a lot of useful skills, especially debuffs. In the gameplay for this game, I've noticed that debuffs aren't useful. They may be effective against regular enemies, I don't know, but against bosses, they're immune to everything. And even if you can dish out a debuff, some of them have, towards the end, a sanctuary ability that removes all buffs and debuffs. So really, most of the time, your only focus in this game will be DPS and healing occasionally, whether that DPS comes from physical attacks or magic. Physical attacks are also useless outside of regular battles, because in boss battles, enemies have pig thick skin. You cannot dish effective damage unless you do what I do, which is Shining Blade followed by Super Combo, or the other way around. Towards the end, bosses just won't respond effectively to physical attacks. You'll have to get really specific with which kind of physical abilities you'll use on them, and what kind of skills you'll use on them, because otherwise you're not going to make too much of a dent in terms of DPS. It's better to just combine magic, which is another cool feature. Based off of elemental properties, if you mix ice with earth, earth with wind, earth with fire, fire with wind, wind with ice, you can combine spells. In fact, you can do a lot of interesting combo attacks, which really makes the DPS in this game really cool and effective. Other than that, there's not a lot of depth, which I see as a problem. It's not nearly enough. In fact, I would go on to say that Final Fantasy XIII, which I've bashed quite unfairly, but again, I had higher standards at the time. I was more closed-minded and rigid. That one had more depth because at least there were things to do outside of DPS, damage per second, and healing. And the storyline was really cool. Unlike the other Breath of Fire games, there's a little bit of a duality going on here. You play, on one hand, as Ryu, and on his, with his other half, his... Um, not not getting into spoilers, but you play as another dude named Fal Lu, who's essentially Magus mixed with Sephiroth, as everyone else says. And he's supposed to be this alternative guy. He fights alone. His battle prowess is on a completely different wavelength from everyone else towards the beginning of the game. And you just watch him be badass, speak in old English, and kick ass. I really liked Fal Lu when I was a kid, because... Just think about his old English speaking. I'm not sure if it's legit or if it's that bullshit Dragon Quest kind. Just think about that was really cool. And his 
cockiness and his character development and just his battle prowess in general was badass and I like Ryu as well in this game I'm gonna tell you the beginning of the storyline which I usually don't do the storyline starts off with Nina a Wendian looking for her sister Alina with uh, and they're searching for her through a sand flyer there's in Nina and Cray. Cray is a warrant who I think Alina was supposed to marry him eventually. The Warren tribes and the Wendians were linked together. But because Alina went missing, they went out searching the east to find her. In the middle of that, there was a ship crash because their sand flyer was destroyed by a dragon. And so Nina went through a desert to look for parts to repair the sand flyer and Cray was there, you know, posting up to make sure that the sand no one sold or did more damage to the sand flyer. As she was going, she saw a impact crater and then she saw like a merchant being stared down by a dragon, I believe, and that dragon developed a humanoid form. It turns out it's her main protagonist, Ryu. Ryu has no memory of who he is, but he eventually tags along with them because they believe he can help them find his sister. And of course they want to help the teenage boy who doesn't know who he is, where he comes from, and has weird dragon abilities for no unbeknownst reason. So I know I suck at summarizing storylines and that's kind of my thing, but that's the beginning. And towards the end when you find out about Ryu's role and how everyone else's destinies get caught up with him and how his destiny is to meet up with the other half, Fao Lu, that's when things get interesting. And I don't want to, I'm going to spoil that because it's not going to really ruin the story, it's going to essentially foreshadow to you how badass things start to get towards the end before the third and fourth act of the storyline kind of muddy things out. I'm gonna go into the criticisms, I'm 17 minutes in and I didn't go into criticisms yet, yeah. Here's the problems I have with the game. First off, it's not as good as I remembered it to be. In the sense that, because I never held on to the controller for much of my experience with it, I was just watching other people play and looking over their shoulder. I didn't really get the full vibe of all the problems this title has. A major problem are bad controls and the bad camera work. Now, a lot of people were very critical of Final Fantasy VII's control scheme, how it seemed that the controller was, the controls were changing on you, depending on which side of the map you were on for the pre-rendered areas, and that's true. However, this one's worse because it seems the controls are affected every time you shift the camera, or any time, or it's just bothered by the isometric perspective in general. There is only one part of this game where you're not anchored by an isometric perspective. And it's just one part where you're going through the planes. That's it. In general, it seems you have to, when you're ever controlling this game, you have to take into consideration the fact that you're looking at things diagonally. That things should be moving diagonally. And it leads into needless random battles because you're walking in and out of rooms it leads to fucking up with mini games and puzzles a lot of time wasted a lot of unnecessary battles and while it's not enough to cause a rage out even for a guy like me it is enough to make the experience 
not so pleasurable and not so likable. It has affected me negatively. Yuji Horii of Dragon Quest makes it a mission of his to check for things like this. Little little comfortable experiences he wants to make sure are in there. He'll walk in and out of rooms when he plays the video games or just move around. Really make sure that the controls are spot on, that everything feels good. Forgot what the term for that was, but I used to use it all the freaking time. Anyway, uh, the controls are bad. In fact, a lot of the mini games in this game, and many of the dungeons had them too, are pretty bad. When you are item scavenging or trying to get through, the mini games are affected by the controls, or affected by the fact that they're not very good and you don't want to play a lot of them. And. Well, that sucks. I don't know what else to tell you. There are way too many mini games. Again, another problem people associate with Final Fantasy VII. VII had a lot of good mini games, but then when it comes to dungeons and puzzle solving, it had a lot of shitty mini games that you didn't necessarily want to go through. Like when you were on those train tracks, it would collapse and you had to, like, shimmy. To a specific spot to get an item. I can see how that would be very annoying. Moreover, this has that problem times 10 because of the isometric perspective. I mean, controls in 7 were made bothersome by the pre rendered backgrounds and how you don't really have a full. 3D control for a 3D game. But that's just a different piece of shit for a different time. Again, these are both great games. In fact, they're both in my top five, if I had a top five. Seven's my favorite Final Fantasy still. Some other thing I didn't like, uh. It was too easy. Now, usually difficulty isn't something that I complain about too much, or lack thereof, because difficulty suits what it's marketed for. There are series that will accommodate you for challenge. However, this one, I never lost. People say Xenogears is too easy. I've lost in Xenogears plenty of times. Chrono Cross was considered too easy aside from people not getting its convoluted battle system. I've lost in Chrono Cross. I only lost once in Breath of Fire 4, and it wasn't even to a boss. It was to a bunch of random enemies because I was goofing off and not paying attention. That was the only time I ever lost in Breath of Fire 4. That's great. So yeah, there's a difference between easy and just kitty shit. It was completely anachronistic to a storyline that was really good, has a lot of deep epic themes. It's really the only good political story I've ever experienced in a JRPG without coming across as a political story. And its themes now are its philosophical themes are also pretty good. It has a deep story, so why is its gameplay so shallow and it feels like the developers were just trying to test for glitches and they forgot to add it in the difficulty. Now towards the end, I thought Falu was gonna kill me. And yes, you do he is the final boss. But I thought that motherfucker was going to kill me. A lot of final bosses, or next to last bosses, did pick up precipitously in difficulty. But it was an illusion of difficulty. 
Now, in the beginning, I would get tripped up because I thought it would be a cakewalk like everything else. However, as I went on, I realized, yo, I'm going to be perfectly alright as long as I keep these, this guy or these two in DPS and occasionally heal with this guy. And since there's no point tanking, it's all about eventually healing and just focusing on DPS. That's all it is. Eventually, the boss will die. If you're doing a lot of damage in a specific, uh, very specific way, he will go down in 10, 20 rounds. That's just how simple it is. So it comes across more of a, as an illusion of difficulty. And yet, for all its simplicities, I wasn't just mashing the confirm button. So as much as I bash the battle system, it's still solid. 10-2 had, and 13 had, um, some kind of depth in their battle systems. A lot of these Final Fantasy games I talk about have a lot of depth, until you realize you're just mashing the X button or even holding it down. You can't do that shit with Breath of Fire 4 as easy as it is. You do kind of have to know your stuff. And the same could be said times 10 for Shin Megami Tensei or the Saga series. So there's that. And lastly, my final criticism before I give you my overall thoughts. Yeah, the mini games. There are some good mini games, and those are the ones that are gonna stay with you for a long time. I thought the fishing mini game was great. Fishing mini game was really good. That's like, I'm fucking even other mini games I've ever played. That shit is on point. The fairy mini game. Supposedly, if you set it up so they have a lot of food. And you have one third of your guys as fairies, one third of your fairies as uh, hunters. Then you can set the speed up really quickly so that your civilization can build, and you have some nice ass shops, some nice ass features for your post game. My cousin and my dad actually did pretty well on it, and they were able to get some neat post game stuff. But since I was taking my sweet ass time, I didn't really have that luxury afforded to me. Because of that, I didn't really get any items to boost my stats or any special abilities to really cheese Falu. And for the post game, you do get a couple of extra stuff, but none of them are really going to be helpful in cheesing any of these bosses. They really won't be. really what's gonna help you cheese follow the second time is reaching your 40s in terms of levels instead of your late to mid 30s because that's when your stats that do matter really start to shine and if you want to cheese Falu, then you need a whole team of mini Falus. that's what's gonna take but other than that I really like this game 10, 2, and 13's post game kind of made it take forever for me to complete this, but overall, it was actually a modest experience. 42 hours, and I loved it. I would recommend it, actually. Now, I do have Wild Arms 1 and 2. I might get started on that, but I do gotta finish Live Alive, and I gotta make more political videos. I actually do have some ideas for some shit, so y'all don't gotta worry about that. It's your boy Mr. Wonka7, and suck my dick.